over here, 900 years. Um, I just want to say the book came out two years ago and why I even wrote it, there really wasn't a book on amusement parks. And growing up in Southern California, I certainly, I knew Disneyland, loved it. And I knew there was a Coney Island. I didn't know much about it until I moved to New York, which is where I am today. And it's gray and rainy here as well. And, uh, and I knew the Chicago World's Fair had something to do with things. But there, there was no, there was an academic book that had been published that was all, uh, mostly about theories. Um, although it stressed the notion, which is important here today, that from the very beginning, the social classes have mixed at these places. It doesn't matter if you're a peasant or an aristocrat or a servant or blue collar, white collar, everybody went to amusement parks throughout the centuries. And um, the other sort of books that were published were sort of local, really hokey things that inevitably began when I was eight years old, says the author, my grandfather took me to such and such park. So I wanted to do something sophisticated and adult up to a point. All right, well, and we'll start at the very beginning. I, I wanna say that since the book has come out, especially the first year I made live appearances and lectures all over the country. The last year I've been doing them via Zoom. And, uh, but th this is a special presentation that I prepared specifically for the group today. And I'm reminded of the song in the Broadway music, musical Spamalot, which was a spoof about King Arthur. Uh, we won't succeed on Broadway if we don't have any Jews. Anyway, you will see that you won't succeed in amusement parks if you don't have any Jews. We'll go to the first image. Gary, that's you. Thank you. Um, it began 900 years ago. I didn't lie on the subtitle. King Henry I in England was very sad. His son had been killed in this tragic shipwreck that was the Titanic of its time. And he had a court jester who was a real social climber and his name was Rahir and he knew the king was superstitious and he wanted to cheer him up. This is 11 in the year 1122. And the jester insisted that St. Bartholomew rescued him in the middle of the night. He had this dream in which a dragon came and took him out of his bed. And to thank St. Bartholomew, the jester was to start a fair in his honor every year. And he asked the king for land, which the king granted in London on the joust, former jousting field. It was a smooth field. They called it Smithfield. And once a year, starting on August 24th, 1133, there was Bartholomew Fair. And there's an image there in the upper right-hand corner. And I know it's difficult to see, but it has all the ingredients that still go into amusement parks today. Not only does it attract crowds, it has bright lights, it has theatrics, it has food. Back then, the big things were gingerbread and really thinly sliced roast beef, which gave way to sausages. And if you look, there is a tiny Ferris wheel. These were all very primitive rides that were hand pushed, there were swings, but there were rides. Um, there were also pickpockets and prostitutes. Um, so this went on for 1100 years. If you remember the movie musical Oliver with Fagan and Bill Sykes, all that crime, that all took place in Smithfield around the Bartholomew Fair area. Although by then, things were shutting down. Next slide, please. So you ask, where are the Jews? Well, it turns out King Henry I was very good to the Jews, whereas previous monarch, monarchs were not. And, um, the Jews were the moneylenders and they helped back Bartholomew Fair and the various vendors because, you know, there were freak shows that started there. There were animal acts that started there, menageries, and it was all part of the fabric. Next slide. And by the way, I'll take questions at the end, but if there's anything that really pops out at you, throw it into chat. Um, all right, so as Bartholomew Fair goes on, uh, over in Russia, there's something about the Russian nature besides, you know, pogroms that they would build these wooden uh, slides in winter. They splash water on a coat of wood 
And they could either be very elaborate if you were an aristocrat, or even if you were a serf, this is how you would play. Next slide, please. I'm making a point here. And Catherine the Great loved them herself. Now she especially, she was a good time gal, as you may have heard. She was the empress. And she'd have a handsome soldier drive her sled down these wooden mountains. Uh, this was just one of her Russian mountains, as they called them. And to this day, throughout the world, except in America, roller coasters are called Russian mountains. In uh, Russia, I'm told they're called American mountains. Um, but Spanish, French, Italian, Russian mountains. This was hers. Next slide, please, Harry. Well, the French saw these Russian mountains when they came to fight the War of 1812, and they took the notion back with them to Paris, where they had pleasure gardens, and they built very elaborate Russian mountains. And they added a new component, wheels to the sleds, um, thus truly making them roller coasters. And as time went on, you would, uh, you would have to climb up to the top peak there before getting in your cart, which is probably why they all look so fit and have those tiny waistlines. But as time evolved, there, was, there were mechanical contraptions that devised how to get the cart back up the hill. Also, <laughs> fences to keep the carts from flying off the hill, which used to happen a lot. Next slide, please. Now, we were more rough and tumble ourselves over here. We didn't have the luxury of fighting in the War of 1812 in Russia. So we didn't know about the Russian mountains. We devised our own and it was mechanical. And it all started in a tiny town, uh, Ma Chunk, Pennsylvania, which today is called Jim Thorpe uh, in honor of the athlete. That's a, another long story. But when it was still Ma Chunk, it was a mining town. And to get the coal, the minerals from the mine caves back down to the river, uh, a, a, a switchback railroad was devised. Well, when the mines were mined out, the city fathers thought, well, what do we do with this? They turned it into the first thrill ride. And it really was. And it, it became a sensation. This is starting after the Civil War. And this ran until the Depression. It was the number two tourist attraction in the United States behind only Niagara Falls. And President Grant wrote it, everybody wrote it. It was a thing to do. Uh, to Edison was brought out to look at it and said, well, you know, should we electrify it? And he said, no, it relies on gravity, leave well enough alone. And there were really hairpin turns and it was thrilling and scary and they claimed never to have lost a passenger. So they claimed. Next slide, please. Enter, this is where it all really begins. There was this fellow, LaMarcus Thompson. He was a garment manufacturer in the Midwest. He put Marshall Fields in business with his, you know, his woolens and whatever, but he had a nervous breakdown. And he had always been a tinkerer. And he also had always been a relig religious zealot. And he thought it was terrible that couples went dancing. That was sinful. So he, he thought, what can I do to give people a thrill? And they won't dance. And he thought of this gravity mountain like he had seen in Mawchunk. And he built it in the most sinful place he could think of. And it opened in 1884. And that was Coney Island on the southern shore of Brooklyn, New York. And it was an instant sensation. And it was immediately right at Coney Island, two copycat roller coasters opened. It, it put him, Thompson, practically out of business. He went to Atlantic City, opened another one. But what he really did, he went to Europe and started switchback railways and be, became very wealthy. He then came back to America, which we'll get to at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. But he also went from the switchback railway, which was simply sort of thrills. His first one went six miles an hour and it only went 600 feet, but they became more elaborate. He also devised something where they would go inside, they weren't paper mache, but they were mountains. 
it would go into tunnels in the mountains and they, the ride would slow down and he would hire theater designers to create elaborate tableaus. Uh, you know, if, if you really want to put it this way, the, Dis the Disneyland Matterhorn wasn't all that new, except it was far more sophisticated and smoother. Thompson thought up all this stuff. Okay, we'll go to the next, which anyway, I want to stop at Coney Island. Um, that took off starting in the 1820s. It was a place where Bohemians from Greenwich Village in Manhattan would go. And it, Walt Whitman used to go there and there was one hotel and Walt Whitman would go uh, nude swimming, skinny dipping. And uh, it, it caught on, it became more middle class, but also uh, it, it became more elaborate. It was developed, um, it all, but there were various sections for various clientele, as I'll show you on the map, the next. Okay, working your way east, uh, but starting in the west, that was called, that was where the ferry would land, and it was really down and dirty there. It was called the gut, and people who, the prostitutes and the saloon keepers, who uh, lived and worked there were called gutters. But as you worked your way east, it became nicer and nicer. And sort of middle class, there was um, West Brighton and then Brighton Beach, and then there was Manhattan Beach. And that was developed by a man named Austin Corbin, who was a railroad baron. He owned the Long Island Railroad. He was a virulent anti-Semite and he took pride and pleasure in announcing that he would exclude Jews from his luxurious resort, which was only for the likes of Diamond Jim Brady and society, which is why he called it Manhattan Beach. There was a, pr a train that went directly there. People didn't have to go west. The problem was all the fun stuff was in the west and it was really dry veined and boring in the east. Next slide, please. And there were editorial cartoons at the time. That's Corbin on, on the far right. But there, you know, it was also in the Catskills and everywhere that hotels did not want Jews, period. Um, next slide. But Coney was such a magnet that, you know, they couldn't keep the Jews away. They may not have gone to Manhattan Beach, but they populated the rest of it. And so things started to develop around Coney Island, including rides here and there. There was no concentrated place where you'd find amusements. This is the first merry-go-round that went in in 1876. And there were, yeah, you also have to keep in mind that at the time, swimming in the ocean was exotic and scary. People didn't do it. They really did think there were sea monsters in there. But Coney Island helped make that popular. And they, even they figured out a way to, to shine bright lights on the water at night. They called it night bathing and it became a sensation. Next slide. So that's Coney Island up until about the 1880s. In 1893, Chicago holds a World's Fair. It's, it's to honor the 400th anniversary of the uh, arrival. They came a year late of the arrival of Columbus on our shores. And the main part of the fair was gorgeous. Uh, it was a tribute to arts and science and industry, but it was very staid and it wasn't popular with the public actually. It got rave reviews. Um, Frederick Olmsted was the landscape artist. Daniel Burnham was the chief architect. Uh, he, Burnham had built the first skyscraper in Chicago. And this was called the White City for the alabaster look of it. Also because they only wanted white people to go to the fair. Uh, next slide. And now we have Solomon Bloom. Now, <laughs> there was to be a fun zone in the fair. It, that was always meant to be. In the previous fair, which was in Paris, 
there was the Eiffel Tower, which was the symbol of the fair. There were also various rides and attractions besides the pavilions dedicated to food and industry and creations. Um, Chicago marked the first time that there was one area devoted strictly to having fun. And unfortunately, I never, I still can't find a photo, a picture or even an illustration of the young Solomon Bloom. He was 23 when the Chicago Fair took place. He was 19 when the Paris Fair took place. And he had gone there and he bought the rights to the uh, Arabian Village. And what happened was when the Chicago Fair was being planned, again, it was all to be very high-minded. And a professor from Harvard was hired for the fun zone. And he was just a disaster. Bloom had already offered his uh, Arabian village to the fairgoers and he planned, not only planned to do it, but he was bringing a main attraction. In the, so at the age of 23, Solomon Bloom, who couldn't finish school, he quit at nine years old because he wouldn't take charity. All his school books were donated. His parents were so poor, but he was a prodigy and he was able to retire at the age of 18, but he didn't. Um, he had a furniture business, nationally renowned, and he was rich <laughs> at 15. Um, but he, he sold the business and instead of retiring, he got into the fair business at first. He also, um, among the attractions at the World's Fair that Solomon Bloom is responsible for, he presented we called her a belly dancer, but in fact, she revealed nothing. Everyone thought she did, named Little Egypt. And not only did he present her, but he very wisely went to all the um, preachers in Chicago, ministers, and said, this horrible dance is going to be performed at the fair. You must warn your parishioners not to go, which they did. And guess what? <laughs> You cannot buy a ticket to Little Egypt because she was sold out. Bloom also wrote her theme song, which you know, you've heard a thousand times in Bugs Bunny cartoons and elsewhere. And you may even have sung a version on in the schoolyard. Da 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 da. Anyway, Solomon Bloom wrote that. He foolishly did not copyright it. So others took credit for it, but it was Solomon Bloom. Next slide, please. He had a life after the fair. Um, he was responsible in part for the League of Nations. He became a very distinguished congressman from New York State. And I mean, you don't get your death announced on the front page above the fold of the New York Times unless you're a big deal. So. If you don't believe me, believe the New York Times. Solomon Bloom was a big deal. <laughs> so much for Solomon Bloom. There was another big deal at the fair and it spun around, but it didn't have as good a story as Solomon Bloom. Um, there was a, a mechanical engineer who attended a luncheon for architects and engineers in Chicago a year before the fair and Daniel Burnham was addressing them and actually dressing down the group to say, you know, we're gonna have a fair, we don't have a symbol. Paris had the Eiffel Tower, what are you people gonna do? And the submissions he got, he hated, they were basically ripoffs of the Eiffel Tower, including one made of logs with a log cabin on top, after all, Illinois being the land of Lincoln. And legend holds as, Burnham was yelling at them or insulting them. George Ferris, who's from the Midwest, then grew up out West. His grandfather was instrumental in the Underground Railroad and sneaking slaves. He was a minister, had them in his church and would hide them. Uh, his uncle introduced popcorn to Queen Victoria she didn't know what to do with it, so she put it on string, um, put it on a Christmas tree. Anyway, Ferris designs this enormous wheel, but enormous. These are train cars in each one. And he takes his 
blueprints to burn him, tells him you're crazy. Uh, not only will it collapse, but who would ride such a thing? And um, we won't give you any money. Whereas the government of France gave Eiffel the money for the Eiffel Tower. So Ferris, it became an obsession. He got the wheel built. He raised his own money. He sold his rights to it to get every last penny. He, he became a mental wreck. It ruined his marriage. Um, but the, the wheel opened and it didn't open in time for the fair's opening day. It opened weeks later. And sure enough, as Burnham said, nobody would ride it. But then there was a terrible storm that blew through Chicago and tents were blown away, buildings were damaged, the wheel did not budge. And so the publicity team went to work and people lined up to ride this wheel. In fact, it ran a week longer than the fair just to accommodate everybody. Ferris did get his money back, but he foolishly refused to sell franchises. So he died three years after the fair uh, in a charity award. It's a terrible story but worth knowing. And if you, again, I should have said at the very beginning, you know, obviously I'm skimming over things, but if you want all the details are in my book. Next slide, please. Another guy who did benefit from the fair was this crazy man named Paul Boynton, who was a deep sea daredevil. Marion Brockett, I love your cat. I just have to interrupt. <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like Miss Francis on Romper Room. I can see you. Anyway, um, Boynton jumped into the Irish Sea in the middle of the storm to, to sell his uh, deep sea diving outfit, which was made of vulcanized rubber. It converted into a kayak and he did survive and he was presented to Queen Victoria. That's what he looked like. I, I mean, he, he looks like something out of Spam a lot. But when he was in Paris, he saw this ride. Russian mountain in one of the um, pleasure gardens there, but it involved splat, the, a splashdown. It would end in a boat and he bought the rights to it and he brought it over to America and he renamed it the Shoot the Shoots. And a year after the fair and near the fairgrounds, he, opened, he had a park with only mechanical rides, the first of its kind, and including the Shoot the Shoots. And he put a fence around it and he charged admission. And thus we have the world's first real amusement park in Chicago in 1894. And it was so successful that he wanted to build an offshoot. I just thought of that, uh, of the shoot to shoots. Um, and he went to the successful resort, which was the premier resort in the world at the time, Coney Island. Next slide, please. And Paul Boynton built the first amusement park in Coney Island, which over the next two decades would become synonymous with amusement parks. If you, say, you used to say Coney Island and people would think it's a seaside resort. But after Sea Lion Park and what happened as a result, you'd say Coney Island it meant amusement park. This was it. It was a marshy property he bought. There's the shoot to shoots in the middle of it. There's, there's a roller coaster. He had sea lions. He was the main attraction. He was such a celebrity. And uh, this opened in 1895. And his problem was, as it would develop, New Yorkers have very short attention spans. And, you know, we'll go back to a place, but they've got to add something new. There has to be, you know, some novelty. Or something. He didn't update his park. Next slide. And he paid a price. Now, this is the fellow who really built Coney Island as, as we still know it today. Um, his name was George Tillyou. And his father was a CPA for the city of New York. And at the end of the Civil War, when George was three, his father went out to Coney Island and, and built what they called a bathhouse which was merely a place where you would rent <laughs> woolen bathing suits, which is all they had then. And you, they'd still be wet from the previous customer, but how he, not only did the rental pay the rent, but Tilly's father 
uh, gave away free clam chowder, which was so salty that he knew that people would buy beer. So he made his money from beer. Uh, until you grew up in this atmosphere, and when he saw what Paul Boynton had created, he wanted something of his own, as it was till you, as he grew up, built various rides that were scattered throughout the resort. But he, he liked the idea of, of Boynton's to concentrate them all in one area. And he, he went to Chicago Fair. In fact, that's where he spent his honeymoon with his wife, Mary. He wanted to bring the Ferris wheel to Coney Island. Ferris wouldn't franchise it. Ferris even turned down uh, an offer uh, to build the Ferris wheel at 37th and Broadway here in New York, which if you know Manhattan at all, is the old is the garment district and uh, just two blocks from Macy's, the main department store. Anyway, till you decides I'm, I'm going to build my own park. He can't do the shoot to shoots because Boynton has that and he figures I will find a ride of my own. Next slide, please. So he goes to England where he hears about a mechanical racehorse and he buys the franchise and he calls it steeplechase and he improves the ride and he builds it as the fence around his park, which he calls steeplechase park. And that opens in 1897 and it was the longest running park. It ran until 1966. Um, later on, I'll tell you why it closed along with a lot of other parks at that time. But it was the fun place to go. And as New York developed its subway, Coney Island became known as the Nickel Empire because it was a nickel to take the subway to get you to Coney Island. And it brought the masses at that point, the swells in Manhattan Beach were long gone. What really drove them away, New York State banned uh, horse race gamble, gambling. Uh, so those hotels in Austin Corbin were essentially run out of Coney Island. Uh, but it was the place to go. And the rides were a nickel. The hot dogs were a nickel, and we'll get into them too. Um, next slide, please. So in 1901, Till You goes to the Buffalo World's Fair. We know the Buffalo World's Fair because that's where... President McKinley was shot, which sort of spelled the end of the fair. But there were two guys who had developed two attractions there. One was a double Ferris wheel, and the other was this pavilion called A Trip to the Moon, which really was like the Disneyland rocket to the moon in the 1950s. But you would go there and there was this, inside the pavilion was this enormous clipper ship that looked like something out of Jules Verne. You would board it, they had fans making you feel like you were taking off and the image, the sky above you, images would change as though you were being propelled in the sky. The ground below, Buffalo, New York would disappear below you, which isn't the worst crime. Um, anyway, and then you would land and you would disembark and you would be greeted by small people. Um, carrying order, offering hors d'oeuvres of green cheese. And then you would see a song and dance show like the Rockettes, but with a space theme. And then you would go to meet the man in the moon, the king who would, uh, on his throne, who would greet you. Then you were guided to show you that nothing is new to a souvenir stand inside the pavilion where they would sell you moon objects. And then the final adventure to get you out of there and bring in a new uh, crowd, you'd go down a chute and come back on, on the midway. So Till You offers these two guys who were named Frederick Thompson and Skip Dundee. Um, one was the money guy, the other was the architect and the designer. He was really the Walt Disney of his time. Um, they were both heavy drinkers and womanizers, which led to their downfall, but they also went on to build the New York Hippodrome. Anyway, Till You says, will be 50-50 partners, bring your attractions to Steeplechase Park. And the first season they do that, the attractions are a big success. But again, New Yorkers want new things until you said, I'm not gonna be a 50-50 partner, I'll give you 20%. And they essentially said, told him where to go. They, hire, they had hired an elephant to drag the pavilion and the, the um, 
double Ferris wheel across what is the main drag, Surf Avenue, to the, and they buy out Paul Boynton because his place has, has gone to rack and ruin. And they devise the most elaborate part that the world had ever seen up to this point. Next slide, please. And in 1903, they opened Luna Park, and it is a spectacular place that brings the world to Coney Island and has, it has a quarter of a million electric lights. And this is a time New Yorkers did not have electricity in their apartments. So you can imagine the thrill at night to suddenly see this place. It was a combination of Venice and Calcutta and... Uh, Spain and Morocco and all that. I mean, condensed Epcot, if you've been there. Uh, and it was non, everywhere you looked was action. Next slide. And it was a tremendous success. It made Thompson and Dundee rich and successful beyond their wildest dreams. They squandered it and they drank it away and they lost it to bankers. Anyway, you're at this point, of course, you're asking, so where are the Jews? Well, they were feeding everybody. And this goes back to 1867, when a fellow named Charles Feltman uh, had a, a, a lunch cart. And to make a long story short, he devised, he remembered the sausages and he put them on a roll and he devised the hot dog. And he would be this way, people could eat and they didn't need utensils. And it was a sensation. The hot dog was invented by Charles Feldman. He uh, was so successful that by the 1920s, he had the biggest restaurant in the world. This is a Coney Island. And along the way, there, there were singing waiters. Uh, among them, Irving Berlin started as a piano player there. Eddie Cantor, if you know who he was, was an enter tremendous entertainer on vaudeville. Uh, he started, he was a singing waiter there. Jimmy Durante, if you remember him, he was there. Anyway, Feltman's was a landmark. He had a, uh, young employee, Feltman did, named Nathan Handworker. Next slide, please. And Feltman's hot dogs were a dime. Nathan Handworker thought, I'll sell mine for a nickel. And what he was doing, he, he used to slice Feltman's buns. That's how he started. Anyway, he opens, Nathan's famous. Nathan is brilliant at promoting. Uh, he called them famous before they were famous. He hired actors to pose as doctors and eat the hot dogs at the stands in, in their Dr. Whites. So people thought these were healthy to eat. And Nathan's is still there on the very site. And I'm sure you've all heard of Nathan's hot dogs. They're, every 4th of July, we have the Nathan's hot dog eating contest. Um, today, it is, it is owned by a large corporation. It is ch actually Chinese. Next slide, please. Anyway, Luna Park is such a sensation that the fellow named Frederick Ingersoll, Ingersoll franchises them. And in fact, he, this is the first one there ever was in Pittsburgh. And it was so early that, and this is true, there's no H on the end of Pittsburgh. Um, he franchised them all over the world. There are still two that exist in Sydney and Melbourne, Australia. They were in Europe. They, uh, they were in America from around 1910. There were 2000 amusement parks in America alone. They were mostly connected to trolley cars. They were the, at the end of the trolley cars uh, lines. And they were owned by the railroad barons who had built the trolley car lines then. Um, but remember, there were no cars then. And the, people didn't, there were no movies. So this was mainstream entertainment. Next slide, please. We even had one in Manhattan at the very northern tip. And... Next slide, please. The one, it's the one and only amusement park that's ever been in Manhattan. And it was bankrolled by a fellow named Marcus Lowe. You may have heard of Lowe's Theaters. Uh, they don't call the chain that anymore, but he started it. He's the one. Um, he made his money uh, with Nickelodeons. He then started a movie studio you may have heard of called Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Um, 
Next slide, please. And to manage Fort George Amusement Park, he had these two brothers who were from the Lower East Side, Joseph and Nicholas Skank. Um, they then left, not only did Lowe own M MGM, but the Skanks, that when they sold their interests uh, in New York amusement parks, they went to Hollywood and ran 20th Century Fox and United Artists. So the amusement park industry in New York, once again, you won't succeed on Broadway if you don't have any Jews. Next, uh, oh, but the, the, but the residents in Northern Manhattan did not want the noise or the crowds up there. So they torched the place. It, it was a victim of arson. And the Skank brothers said, next slide, please. We will rebuild. They never did. They in, instead went across the river, the Hudson, to New Jersey, where there was a picnic ground, and they started something called Palisades Park. Next slide. I want to give the West Coast equal time. Um, the image in the middle there is the Sutro Baths, which I'm sure you've seen that lithograph. It's a famous poster. And there really was such a place. It, it's on the outskirts uh, near the, what was the Cliff House in San Francisco. It was started by Adolf Sutro, uh, a Jewish emigre from Germany who made his fortune in the California gold rush. He devised a method of ventilating the mines. And he became the largest real estate holder in San Francisco uh, and became the first and possibly to this day only Jewish mayor of San Francisco. Uh, he, he felt the public needed a playground. So he built the Sutro Baths and he bought the remnants of an old world's fair and attached rides adjacent to it. That later developed, um, in sort of 1912, 1913, going on into Playland at the Beach, which was San Francisco's equivalent of Coney Island up until 1972. And you can see it in, in various movies, including uh, Pal Joey. And uh, it, from all reports, it was a great amusement park. Next slide. Now, as I said, there were no movies back then. Now, so the, the common experience was to go to an amusement park and they all had the same rides, really. So the country was familiar with, everyone had a merry-go-round. This, this one was built by, next slide, please. Marcus Illions and his sons. And he was considered the Michelangelo of, caras of carousel horse carvers. And he was very grand figure himself, uh, a Jewish. And every morning he would take a canter through Brooklyn on his horse. He and his sons not only built merry uh, carved merry-go-round horses uh, up until the depression, that was the end of their company, but they carved the bemas for all the synagogues in Brooklyn, the most beautiful. So once again, here they are. All right, next slide. And this is the example. And this is a restored Ilian's carousel horse, and it's still spinning today at Coney Island, which I'll get to its fate later on. Don't worry, we're not going on forever. Next slide. <laughs> and every amusement park had a, what became a new version of the Ferris wheel. As I said, Ferris sold his rights. Uh, and became, you know, more adaptable. Next slide, please. Had a whip. I just rode one of these at Dorney Park two weeks ago in Pennsylvania. Uh, this was developed by a fellow at Coney Island named William Mangles, who was sort of a ride expert. And you see them in old silent movies with Buster Keaton and Fatty Arbuckle when they go to amusement parks. Next slide, please. And every respectable amusement park had a tunnel of love. Now, these women didn't get the message that they were supposed to pick up guys and go on it. But, um, and it was simply a boat that the current would carry you through. Sort of like It's a Small World or Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, 
and they would simply go in dark tunnels where they could do in there what they couldn't do at home with their mothers watching. Next slide, please. But here's the villain of the piece. When the Mary Oldsmobile and the Ford Model uh, T became so popular, everybody had one. So going for a mechanical ride in an amusement park was not a big deal. Next slide. The antidote was, and it came in re uh, by the 1920s, really, was a thrill you couldn't get behind the wheel of your Mary Oldsmobile. That is the roller coaster. And this one is a national landmark. It opened in 1927 at Coney Island. It's considered the grandfather or the grandmother. Actually, grandmother, I was corrected. Um, it, it, it's considered like a ship uh, to be feminine. Um, it was built by two brothers, Jack and Irving Rosenthal. And it was built on the site, actually, of Lamarcus Thompson's first switchback railroad, the one he built in 1884. Um, they became very successful with this and they bought out the Skank Brothers who, at Palisades Park in New Jersey and R Irving Rosenthal ran Palisades in New Jersey and, until he closed it. Today it's the site of a really awful generic looking condominium uh, in 1972. Anyway, we got the roller coaster and there are very few wooden roller, authentic wooden roller coasters left today. Insurance companies don't want to cover them and the maintenance costs are high. But as I said, this one's a national landmark, so it is preserved. And you're all welcome to come and ride it. It's $10 a ride. Next slide, please. And the thing about it is, I had to write it when the book came out. Um, the, the, the hills aren't so bad, but the turns are killers. Um, and that's Irving Rosenthal uh, sometime in the 1960s uh, in Palisades Park, which was simply, I went to Columbia University and I, I after it had closed, so there was no sign of it. But I, I was told if I went to Grant's tomb, I could see Palisades Park. Next slide. And then we have, uh, you know, something else that put a nail in the coffin. That was the depression. Next slide. But then during the war, there was sort of a reprieve because they were sort of oases where service men could take their dates before being shipped off. Next slide, please. But then after the war, they, you know, there, there wasn't the maintenance. They were still popular in some quarters. That's Elvis Presley riding a bumper car. Um, next, please. But they really became tawdry and they were, you have to remember, they were built at a time, uh, they were trolley cars downtown. Urban areas had changed and they were changing. This is actually the New Pike in Long Beach, which was a pretty down and dirty kind of place uh, with tattoo parlors, there were brothels uh, and, you know, main attractions were freak shows. Next. So what really killed them amusement parks, television. Kids could stay home and watch cartoons on Saturday morning instead of making mommy and daddy take them to the amusement park. They had Hopalong Cassidy and Roy Rogers and um, television was an evil, except to one person. Next slide, please. Now, if you don't know who he is, I'm talking to the wrong group. Anyway, Walt Disney, thought I'll use television as a tool, but he had long had an idea to take his characters, build an amusement park adjacent to his studio, uh, but it, it kept growing, it was too big. And his wife was furious. She said, what do you wanna build one of those filthy things for? He said, mine won't be filthy. And he went all over the world. He studied at Copenhagen's Tivoli Gardens and he saw that beautiful landscaping prevented people from littering and he could not get, it, this is a familiar story. Disney could not get the money to do it. His own brother, who ran the business end of the Disney Studios, Roy, said, if, if you use the characters, the company will sue you. We will prevent you. Uh, finally, Roy came on board. Uh, he took, Walt spent a weekend with a, an art, a studio artist, 
essentially drawing the map of di what became Disneyland. And Roy took it east. CBS said no. ABC, uh, NBC said no. Leonard Goldenson at ABC took a shot. And, you know, I, I just briefly want to say, uh, long discussed that Walt Disney was anti-Semitic. I have no answer for that. I, I, I know that composers who, uh, the Sherman brothers were Jewish, uh, wrote for him, they said no. Um, uh, Martin Sklar, who was his PR guy for years, Jewish, said no. Disney's own daughter said no. I don't know if Disney and his wife invited Jews into their home. I do know that Walt always credited a fellow named Ben Rosenberg of the Bank of America for giving the studio the final financing for Snow White, which is what made Walt Disney rich and what made Walt Disney, Walt Disney. And Leonard Goldenson, Jewish, of ABC, bankrolled Disney money. So I also, one last thing, if you, there are some shots of Walt's office and he has an eight by 10 frame photo on his desk of the actor comedian, Ed Wynn. So I don't know, is Walt Disney anti-Semitic? I don't know. Uh, he opened Disneyland. The opening day was a disaster, but from the second day on, they made lots of money. And next slide, please. And there was an empire. And he didn't, Walt didn't like what happened around the park in Orange County. Uh, there were cheap motels and hot dog stands and he wanted to own the property. He slowly started buying up property in Florida. He didn't live to see the opening of Disney World in 71. It is the number one tourist attraction in the world. Um, and again, the, uh, the stories arose, was Walt Disney anti-Semitic, Michael Eisner, was hired from Paramount Studios when the studio was floundering because for years after Walt's death, the executives had no creativity. It was just, what would Walt have done? Well, they needed to go in a new direction. Eisner did take them in a new direction. His successor was Bob Iger, also Jewish. Um, and with Eisner and Iger, Disney became international. Parks were built elsewhere because who in the world did not want to go to Disneyland? Next slide. And, oh, we are winding up here, uh, but I, I, I just need to get in because invariably I'm asked, so what's the best amusement park today in the world? It is without a doubt, and I'm not the only one who shares this opinion, a place called Tokyo Disney Sea. It is the sister park to Tokyo Disneyland. And it has elements that go back to Luna Park, uh, but it, and it has details and rides and places that exist in no other Disney park. They are right now, it'll be open in 2023. Um, it, it was stalled on account of COVID. Uh, they're, they're opening like three new lands, including a Neverland, just a whole area devoted to Peter Pan, area devoted to Frozen. It is spectacular and unique. Next slide. But you ask, what is the best ride in the world? And that, unfortunately, is going to be very hard to get to right now. It's in Shanghai Disneyland, where I was the first journalist inside. It opened in 2016. And they have a Pirates of the Caribbean there that is just, it has nothing to do with the one we're familiar with here. It is unbelievable. It's got every trick in the book. You don't have to wear 3D glasses. You don't get motion sick, but you are in the middle of a sea battle and other things. It is, it, it, when I was taken on by the Disney publicist, it was very waspish. He looked at me and said, you will plots. And I did. Okay, next one. There are, so once Walt was successful in 1955, other places opened up. Uh, Cedar Point was a resort that the developers wanted to turn into a housing track. Um, the state of Ohio said, no, Walt Disney's been so successful in California, you have to turn it into an amusement park. So they did. Uh, Cedar Point is a corporation. It's called Cedar Fair. They own Knott's Berry Farm. They bought it. Disney wanted to buy Knott's Berry Farm when the family sold it. Anyway, this is why we have 
all those roller coasters at Knott's Berry Farm. Legoland is an international success. We just got one in New York. You, um, there's Six Flags in Texas. That started because the developer in the, in the early 60s went to Walt and said, come on, build in Texas. We'll go 50-50. And Walt said, I don't go 50-50. Um, and then there is in Europe, th this looks like the sphere at Epcot, which is in Disney World in Florida, a place called Europa Park, which is developed by a family that's made rides. And it's made rides for Disneyland. Um, but there, Disney is still the Rolls Royce. Next slide, please. The gold standard, although, and I am wrapping this up, I promise. In the, in the mid 1960s, Lou Wasserman, who ran Universal Studios, said, you know, we used to have a studio tour and they did during silent days. And uh, for a quarter, tourists could walk through and see movies being made and they'd get a, a chicken lunch, all for a quarter. Uh, they had to stop that when sound came in because the tourists made too much noise. The Lou Wasserman said, we've got a back lot. Why, and why don't we let people in? And so they hired Disney engineers and uh, designers and they had Glamour Tram starting in 1965 that added a million dollars a year to the studio. Uh, and then, but it, it was, you know, the, you would go there, that's the house from Psycho, which is still on the back lot. And, you know, by noon people were done and they'd go to Disneyland. So they de devised a way to, how are we gonna keep people here on the Universal lot? They had stuntman shows and it was just, it was hokey. Next slide, please. They, so then by the late seventies, they thought, well, we've got Steven Spielberg under contract here and Spielberg makes a billion dollars a year now licensing his, his movies be, that became rides at the Universal parks throughout the world. So they, that's what they developed. And they were good rides, but again, Disneyland, Disney is the gold standard. Next slide, please. Wasserman and Spielberg, that's where the Jews come from. Uh, just in case you missed it. We, I, when, when I started uh, giving book lectures, I was once told by one Jewish group, we are only interested in Jews. Anyway, so it's a lesson I've taken to heart. So you, but Universal steps up to the plate with Harry Potter. They got the rights with J.K. Rowling and now Universal is a rival to Disney. And this is unheard of, but this is what's going on. And it's, it's good because in Florida, Disney's slipping behind a little. I was just there. And uh, things weren't as slick and polished as they used to be. Next slide. So what does Disney do to compete with Harry Potter? It pays $4 billion to George Lucas and buys out Star Wars, the entire franchise and all the licensing rights. To George Lucas's credit, when he got the check for $4 billion, he contributed it all to education in America. Anyway, we now have Star Wars land in the Disney parks. We are going to get a Star Wars hotel in Disney World where it was just announced that the, the, the price every night is $2,500. That does not include admission to the parks, which is $150 per person. We can talk about how the social classes no longer mix at amusement parks, but that's for another time. Anyway, next slide, please. I didn't get into water slides, but I will mention them that they were built adjacent to regular amusement parks because they don't cost as much. Uh, one ride can cost a hundred million dollars uh, and they're popular and they're a source of revenue. This is one that is very popular in Tel Aviv. So amusement parks and water parks are all over the world. There are 1200 today you know, in the world Remember, there were 2,000 in America alone in 1910. And if you come to New York, there is still Coney Island. Now, it, you couldn't go there from sort of 1970 to 2010. Mayor Bloomberg insisted it, it be redeveloped. It was scary. Um, it, Robert Moses and Fred Trump 
did their best to destroy it and build and change its personality. And it, it just became a place you didn't go. Uh, but Bloomberg sold the rights. And if you go there, they're, they're nice rides. It's very colorful. The, the cyclone remains, the wonder wheel um, still exists. It was a hundred years old last year, but it couldn't be celebrated. So it was celebrated this year. And um, Coney Island lacks personality, but it's safe and clean. So you win some, you lose some. But that in a nutshell, last slide please, is where you are, <laughs> where we are. And as I said, I'll happily take questions. And I did it in an hour, Ari. <laughs> Hello, everybody. You did. You did. The history of Carl Cedar's life in <laughs> an hour. Hi, Donna. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I feel like... <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm trying to look for questions. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, I was hoping you would say, like, I guess the, the, the big Jew, Jewish connection to amusement parks is the most, most recent Universal Studios then. Because yeah. the other studios are really, they may have been financed uh, by, by Jewish bankers or so on, but they didn't, weren't built or designed or envisioned by them. No. So we, we, we were behind the scenes. No, we it's a real mix. Dark. It's a, yeah, like the social classes mixing there. I mean, the entrepreneurs, it was a mix and everybody got, you know, which is good, right? right. <laughs> Um, yeah, people have questions like wh like Wendy. Wendy wants to know where is Star Wars Park. Well, look up. You can look where online. Is where is Star Wars Park? And Star Wars is in Disneyland. In, in Disney, yeah, there's California. a Star Wars land in Disneyland and in the Magic Kingdom in Florida. Uh, Disney World consists of four amusement parks: the Magic Kingdom, which essentially is Disneyland on steroids. It's bigger, and your feet will hurt more because you walk more. Uh, there is the Hollywood Studios, which was built by Michael Eisner because Universal was opening in Orlando. And that has the Star Wars land in Florida. There is Epcot, which was a really scaled down version of Walt Disney's planned community uh, for Florida, which he, he imagined something really elaborate that died with him in 19... 66. Um, and then there's the Animal Kingdom, which is my favorite park. And it, it, it's like a scaled down version of Kenya and India. And they've just done a remarkable job. And it has maybe the best ride in America. Um, and it only exists there called uh, Flight, Pandora Flight of Passage. It's in the Avatar land. Uh, it's which wasn't Disney. Disney bought the rights to that. And you really feel like you're flying. Unlike uh, Soren, which is great, but this really puts you inside. Um, and right. the Star Wars Hotel is being built in Florida. Um, I do have to admit that I am not an amusement park person. I don't enjoy them. I take little, little kids because they have so much fun on non roller I do not do roller coasters. I just don't like them. But from my outside outside perspective, Disney has not succeeded as Universal. You know, with Harry Potter Land, Dis uh, Universal has really upped the game. We'll see if Disney can really. Yeah. I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, people want to know why Disneyland failed on its first day, if you know that story. Oh, yeah. Um, there were too many counterfeit tickets, and it was 100 degrees, and it wasn't finished. And uh, ladies back then wore high heels, and it was an opening. I was televised. That was the real problem. Ronald Reagan, Art Linkletter, Bob Cummings uh, were the hosts with Walt. Walt is just laughing like a little kid throughout. Um, but the, it was either, they could either do bathrooms or water fountains. Walt said, let's do bathrooms. Um, that were finished that day. They ran out of food. The rides broke down. They weren't finished. It was, it was a disaster and it got bad reviews, but there was Walt Disney on television every week, having told little kids in all over America, boys and girls, tell your mommy and daddy to bring you to Southern California and to Disneyland. And kids did, and it was an instant success. 
it just built and then it built and built and built. And it made Walt mega rich. But money was never his guiding force. Everyone who worked with him said, which is interesting, he, he was a creative artist. And it, that place meant the world to him. And, you know, it'd be interesting to, to know what he would think if he were to return to any of these places today. If you wish to beat the lines at Disney World in Florida, you can have a group up to 10 people, I think. I don't know if it's 10, but it is something like $4,000 an hour with a minimum of seven hours. Uh, it, it's outrageous what these things cost. People have asked questions about the uh, carved, um, uh, you know, the, the, the carvers, the wood carvers who carved. Yeah. They were, in, they were in New York. And I have, there was a whole exhibit about that. And I have information I'll share people. It was in New York, um, the people who carved the arcs. They were Eastern European carvers who yes. came to America. It's an amazing story. Um, can we go back to Saul Bloom for a second? So Saul Bloom, yeah. so you, you kind of, I wonder if I got that link. So Saul is the one, he created an incredibly successful entertainment area it, in the it, Chicago it World Fair. showed people that if you put all these rides in one area, People will sh not only show up, but, you know, to the exclusion of the rest of the fair. And that, that was the center of gravity for the Chicago World's Fair. And it's what gave Paul Boynton the idea. I mean, one idea led to the next, but it was really what Saul Bloom pulled together for the Chicago World's Fair, based on his experience of what he had seen on his own at the Paris World's Fair. So there you go. And then um, Jeff Kaufman and others have said they read Devil in the White City, which I right. read as well. Really a great book. Very much, very worth reading. We'll get your book and Devil in the White City and they'll fit together because you'll get. There, I have a, my book is filled with sidebars and I have a whole sidebar devoted to the book, uh, Devil in the White City. Um, what I loved and hated about that book is, you know, I loved reading about the building of the fair, but I knew when I would end the chapter, I was going to start reading about a grisly murder. Right. And I don't like grisly murders. So, um, you don't like amusement parks and I don't like grisly murders. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a fake, exp it's hard to explain. I, I don't need to go. I'd rather go to Europe. And when I worked Apple on Tower this than... book, mostly women told me, I'm not interested in the amusement park. What are you writing about that for? And inevitably their children would be near them. They said, we love them. We'll read your book. What about, I'll ask the last question, which is, can you connect all this now to Las Vegas and the development there, which really is a lot of Jewish history, right? And, but it's become like an well, adult playground. Isn't it like that very adult playground? Yeah, it was, when, <laughs> when Vegas really started going, which is the 50s, I mean, Vegas really started going first, but it was the Jewish gangster starting with Bugsy Siegel. And um, it was called the Adult Disneyland. The Catskills were called Disneyland with Knishes. I mean, Disneyland set a world standard. Uh, so, I mean, but kid, I went, my father was in the liquor business and he, I know he had mob connections and we went to Vegas and I, we stayed at the Stardust Hotel, but we went to all the various hotels. There was, they were nothing but elaborate motels with a lot of sand between them. Uh, and there was nothing, nothing, nothing for a kid to do. And we would no sooner walk in than some guy in a tuxedo would walk over to my parents and get him out of here. But I, I'm grateful because I saw. And, uh, but, you know, so Disneyland was for the family. Walt built it because he would take his little girls to Griffith Park merry-go-round on weekends. And he'd have to sit on a bench. And he thought, you know, I want to build someplace that I can ride along with the kids. That's been well documented. <laughs> Just to tie into another program we've done, Joe wants to know is, uh, do they have, they built uh, music parks in Dubai? Cause they have quite, they've built quite a lot there. I was there. there. I was there. The whole place is an amusement park. It looks like uh, Palm Springs and Beverly Hills in the sixties on steroids, it's very space age. But I, 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 I took the light rail as far as I could take it out and uh, then I had to hire a car and the guy didn't speak English, but I got there. And there was one place, there's a Ferrari, the world's fastest roller coaster is at Ferrari World. 
It goes 149 miles an hour and it, it, it takes off in a second and a half or something. It, it's outrageous. I did not ride that, but I watched people go on it. And uh, there was a charming park based on Bollywood movies. And I like that the most because it was unique. The others are sort of pale imitations of what we have, either at Universal or Disney or Cedar Point. Carl Cedar from New York wants to know about Freedom Land in New York. I have no idea what that is. I figured since Carl asked, I would ask. That was from 1960 to 64. It was built by a fellow uh, named C.W. C.V. Wood. And he said, see for nothing. And he, who was one of the first employees of Disneyland, Walt had him fired because he took too much glory, which is something you didn't do from Walt Disney. He also didn't operate on the level. He was a real schemer. And he passed himself off as the, the master engineer of Disneyland. The Disney company later sued him to make him, they didn't ask for money. They just said, stop saying that. Anyway, he sold people on, on the idea to bankroll in the Bronx, Freedom Land, which was a Disneyland ripoff. It had a train around it, but you know, it was a patriotic theme. It never made money. Uh, and also, unlike Southern California, where you enjoy year-round sunshine, it had to close down in winter. So what the final nail in its coffin was the 1964 World's Fair. Everyone went there. They stopped going to Coney Island. They certainly stopped going to Freedom Land. And Walt, Walt Disney used the 64 World's Fair as his testing ground to see if the Disneyland product would play outside of Southern California, and it did. He had great moments with Mr. Lincoln. He had the Carousel of Progress. He had the dinosaurs that you see at the end of the Grand uh, Canyon diorama on the Disneyland train. That was part of the uh, Ford Pavilion. We rode around in brand new Mustangs, which weren't even on the market yet. And uh, It's a Small World, which was sponsored by uh, Pepsi Cola, and the uh, in honor of the United UNICEF, and the way that happened, Pepsi Cola became involved because on on its board was Joan Crawford, and she insisted that Pepsi have a pavilion at the fair, and she always wanted to maintain a foothold in Hollywood, uh, and you didn't argue with Joan Crawford, so Pepsi Cola sponsored it's a small world, and then Disney Walt took. And he considered building the East Coast Disneyland in New York. And then St. Louis, he was told if you go to St. Louis, you have to serve beer. And he would never have alcohol in his park. Uh, but Florida, of course, despite the humidity and the bugs and the alligators, anyway. And, and that's how all that happened. But Freedom Land was a blip. People who went there, I have friends, loved it. I was never there. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you for staying a little um, overtime to not only tell us the history, but answer questions. And um, we'll do some follow-up after this with, with uh, a link to your book. And um, let's see, uh, I'm interested to know when, when it's safe to travel, which of our CSP people will be the first to go to Ferrari land and get a picture of themselves <laughs> with their CSP hat. You have and to wear uh, shields to keep the bugs out of your eyes. Okay. Well, since Carl's been here, I'm sending Carl. We're going to raise money. We're going to do a GoFundMe. We're going to send Carl. And I don't know. You want to go to Nancy? We're going to send Carl, maybe one of the sons, or who knows. And we're going to send him to Freedom Land. Sorry, to Ferrari Land. And, Freedom um, Land is a bunch of ugly... Uh, yeah, we're not sending him to Freedom Land. Condo. We're sending him to Ferrari Land. We're going to send him to Dubai. It's in the Bronx. You know. And, you know, Carl just... I mean, I should say this. Carl works for Disney. So, but... Oh. You know, and Carl's Jewish. So, you know... I'm sure there's lots of Jewish people working. But, there. Yes. I'm sure. They, I don't know what they have to do in their secret when they get hired and their salutes and stuff like that. I have no idea what they do at Disney. But when I, I worked there, it was 1970. There were not a lot. Well, there's. A, I think I have a feeling there's a lot there. The Imagineers, they're probably all Jewish. Anyway, but but I think we're sending Carl to uh, Ferrari World because I want to see him <laughs> on this ride. I don't know if he'll go on. I don't know if Carl does. I don't do it. It's fun to watch. I was not do. Well, we'll give you a Xanax, Carl. We'll raise money. It'll include two Xanax. <laughs> flight, bring round your trip flight. The cardiologist. Bring your cardiologist. 
and we're gonna, he's going to paint his whole face with CSP colors and CSP. It's worth it. This is like a great gimmick. Please, I will tell you how to raise the money. We'll do a GoFund. How much is it going to cost to fly him there and put him on this thing, Stephen? I forget what the admission was in the park, but, you know, I, I got a press pass. So I'll help you any way I can. Will you help? Will you yes, go with I him? Will. I will. Will you go with Carl and hold his I, hand? I maintained a good relationship, but they still send me all their bulletins. I got one today. Okay, uh, well, you, know, okay, fine. You, you have to show proof of vaccination. We will send you I'm with glad Carl. They're doing it. I want you could take the, the video right before it takes off. Okay. It makes me sick just thinking about it. I have to have lunch. So thank you all for uh, joining us, telling us, the, learning about the history. Uh, uh, and Saul Bloom, he's the key, I think. That's why we dedicate the memory of Solomon Bloom, guys. Solomon Bloom. Um, take care. Be safe. Don't go to any uh, roller coasters right now without your mask and being vaccinated. Jeff Kaufman seems very interested in everything amusement park. Yeah, I'd be getting 25,000. I'm not ignoring you, Jeff. It's just I see all the stuff you've been sending me. I don't go. If anybody would like to take my children on roller coasters, please email me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Harrison, Jan, and maybe you guys, because I'll take them to Disney to see like all the new stuff. You know, Disney has this new, what is it, Carl? The new uh, uh, Marvel Universe thing. Marvel Universe. They want to go see Marvel Universe. I'll take them to go see that. Have you, have you been there, Stephen, to Marvel yeah. Universe? Oh, would you email me? Carl will set it up for you. You want to <laughs> You want a press thing? You yeah. been invited to? Yeah. Carl, uh, I, I could probably finagle, but I would rather. <laughs> yeah, this is like a writer. He needs to go there, check it out, write something about uh, Marvel Universe. Okay, take care, everybody. Keep safe. Thank you. Time.